This is Bold Dominion, an explainer for state politics in a changing Virginia. I'm Nathan Moore. You're a news consumer, maybe even a news junkie. When you read about political violence or terrorist attacks, they always seem remote. It's a thing that happens in other places, places you don't go to. Certainly not places where you play on the swings with your kid, where you go for walks and get ice cream. Four years ago, those places in Charlottesville transformed into a battle scene during the Unite the Right rally, and I was there. I helped organize grassroots support teams that day for anti-racists and anti-fascists. Here in Charlottesville, the grassroots support teams, we held down McGuffey Park and Court Square Park throughout the day. We provided a safe place, medical care, food and water, and music, and we stayed in touch via walkie-talkies. Around 1.30 that afternoon, we were feeling cautious, but somewhat optimistic. The Nazis and the fascists had largely been pushed out of downtown Charlottesville, and some of my friends were marching near the downtown mall with a big group of anti-racists. And then I heard my friend Liz's voice on my walkie-talkie, sobbing. A car just drove into the crowd. That moment and what followed are seared into my memory. Four years later, this is still a moment we mark time by. It has shaped us as people, and it shaped the social and political landscape of Charlottesville and Virginia. And today on Bold Dominion, we're going to look at how the Unite the Right rally changed Virginia politics, from the removal of Confederate statues to the future of our democracy. Well, you know, very concretely, literally concretely, (laughs) um, Virginia has started to, to reckon with Confederate monuments and the many ways that Lost Cause mythology permeates how history is taught and remembered. The statues were a visible manifestation of a lot of systemic things that weren't as obvious, or at least weren't as obvious to folks in power, let's put it that way. The voices of Sally Hudson and Jelaine Schmidt. Sally represents Charlottesville in the Virginia House of Delegates, and Jelaine is a professor at the University of Virginia. They join us later in the show to talk about what has changed in Virginia and what hasn't changed yet. But we start off the show with Emily Gorsinski, She's a data scientist who tracks far-right groups, and she starts off the episode today talking about what the Unite the Right incident tells us about American politics. When we look back at what has happened in American politics over the past, say, 10 years, I think we will eventually recognize Charlottesville and Unite the Right as one of the more important events in American politics because it represented a turning point. Um, It represented a turning point in our relationship with this idea that democracy is something that is participated in by people who are acting in good faith and by people who are, have the best interests of of American uh, ideals and and the American people in their heart. And I think what what happened in Charlottesville um, four years ago really took the shine off of that for a lot of people. I think a lot of people woke up and they said, wait a second, political violence is happening here at home and it's it's happening in ways that I can't ignore it. It's happening in the same ways that we thought were distant history. You know, the, the same sorts of imagery from Nazi Germany in the 1930s. Um, and then we also saw, you know, with the president's comments about very fine people on both sides, this breach in in the sort of sacred decorum of, you know, when bad things happen, we're supposed to unify as a people. We're supposed to say the right things on Monday night football, pregame shows, and and all of those things, and and that didn't happen. So I think that it represented this turning point where we can no longer rely on civility as a mediating factor in our politics. So I think that Charlottesville represented a turning point um, in a lot of ways in things that were much, much bigger than what, what the actual event was about. You track the far right as, as a data scientist, one of the things you're best known for. The dark forces that we saw unleashed here in Charlottesville in August 2017, where are they today? Most of them have become um, totally marginalized in every way. Um, many of the groups that came and organized and marched no longer exist in any meaningful form. At the same time, other forces have have grown um, in their wake 
And there's a good argument to be had that the movement that came into Charlottesville was always a disposable movement that was really there just to to achieve one kind of political goal. And what is that and, goal? Well, that, that goal was to sort of move the, the Overton window, the sort of the no, renorming American society to be more rightwards, right? And I think that they succeeded in that. Um, because now you have people like Newt Gingrich, a pretty mainstream Republican name, going on you know, Fox News and talking about great replacement theory, which is one of these white nationalist, deeply racist theories that actually inspired multiple mass shootings around the world. So these things have now become mainstream. And the movement that came to Charlottesville, they were useful fools. They were there to sort of set the, set the boundaries of the new extreme. And then everything that we look at in the wake, we look at kind of compared to what's what was happening in Charlottesville. And we say, okay, well, it wasn't as bad as Charlottesville. So I guess it's okay. Right, right. They're not literally mowing people down with a car. Uh, this is just talk, right? On the, and it's become, like you say, a, a mainstream part of Trumpism as, as the sort of dominating force in the Republican Party. I mean, right now there's a gubernatorial election happening in Virginia with Democrat Terry McAuliffe and then Glenn Youngkin, um, who on paper looks like he would have been one of these kind of old school country club Republicans, rich guy with a finance background. But this year on the campaign trail, he's he's speaking to this far right base, uh, including these election conspiracy theories that have been promulgated since Trump's defeat last November. I mean, how much of that language and, and how much of that far right ideology is just part of the picture these days? I think it's very much just part of the picture because it traffics well. Um, it's what gets clicks. It what get, it's what gets attention. It's what's driving the conversations in the after church dinners and in the, you know, the Sundays in the golf course and at the Friday nights at the football games. Right. Um, this is very much a part of um, the way that politics and media are being presented to people. And so what we see is a lot of Republicans latching on to Trumpism, even if they were not aligned politically with what Trump was doing, um, you know, politicians are going to ride the wave to power. And a lot of them are taking a gamble that Trumpism is not dead just because Donald Trump is no longer president. And they're going to use, in fact, some of them are even betting that Donald Trump's loss actually works in their favor because now they can paint themselves as a victim of a grand conspiracy and use that to try to mobilize people um, to become to further polarize um, our society to create these rifts and to use that to ride a wave into into power. Emily Gorsinski is a data scientist who tracks far right groups, those who were involved with Unite the Right and others. And we turn now to Jelaine Schmidt. Jelaine's a professor at the University of Virginia, and for several years she's advocated for the removal of Charlottesville's Confederate statues, which finally came down this summer. To educate the public, Jelaine co-led historical tours of Charlottesville's Confederate monuments and what they represented. I talked with her about the 2017 Unite the Right rally and what has happened in Virginia politics since. The pretext, I don't even want to say precipitating, but the pretext, you know, for the those folks who attacked our community was, you know, was the attempt to uh, take down a Confederate monument. You know what I mean? That is the community had, you know, made clear that our, this does not comport with our values. We need to move, you know, we, we need to move that thing out of here. And, you know, um, you know, so we were attacked because we tried to change, you know, we didn't want these symbols of white supremacy, um, you know, and so then, you, you know, a couple of years later, I guess, you know, November, 2019, the Democrats take over both houses of the general assembly. And of course already had the governorship, um, and so a lot of us, you know, I, I didn't have a Thanksgiving, a Christmas or a New Year's, you know, and, and some other people too, you know, we worked really hard to, in the eight weeks between, uh, 2019 election and the January 8th opening of the General Assembly in 2020, we worked really hard to get a statewide network together. It was, you know, Monumental Justice Virginia coalition, uh, to lobby the state legislature, the, the, the General, General Assembly to get that law changed mm -hmm. about, uh, war memorials, you know. Um, you know, and I remember saying to, you know, to Kay Corey, I said, this is not theoretical for us. This is not an abstraction. There was literally blood spilled on our streets. People were killed. We need this, you know, and so we really used the full force of our moral pressure. Uh, uh, Sally Hudson really stepped up and wonderful allies in the Virginia Legislative Black Caucus, you know, who are also, you know, pushing this through. 
Um, you know, so it took a lot of work, mm -hmm. you know, in, in 2020 to, to get that bill passed. So the monuments around the state, like are many of them are down. I mean, there's still some smaller towns in Southside that have left their Confederate statues mm -hmm. up, but but a lot of these Confederate memorials have been taken down. Um, they're gone. What's it mean? It means that at least with our visible emblems in our public spaces, that we uh, 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 do not recognize these uh, symbols as you know representative of our community and the sorts of values that we want to celebrate. Uh, we didn't remove history. We changed who we commemorated. You know, we said this is not worthy of honor in our most visible public spaces. Uh, you know, we're not going to forget these people. They're in the history books. We're going to teach about them, but we're going to reframe them within a liberatory narrative that privileges um, democratic principles and democratic struggles. It's not a small thing. You know, it's, it's Virginia uh, saying, you know, we're not just the capital of the Confederacy. That was, you know, something that, you know, is, you know, uh, happened in the past. It's definitely, you know, part of our history. But this is, you know, we're more than that. You know, there's lots of, uh, of residents here, of citizens here that are, you know, struggling for a new future. You know, the bold dominion, you know, if, if you will. And, and it's fun, you know, in the, in the Monumental Justice uh, Virginia campaign, uh, we talked about a new dominion, yeah. you know, instead of the old dominion. It's yeah. like, you know, what would it be, what would it look like to face forward? Bold dominion. You're just playing to the studio audience here. That's right. <laughs> You know, you and I have talked a number of times before, though, and and about how, yeah, it was very partially about the statues, the mm -hmm. Unite the Right rally and, and all the issues around it. But I remember you using this phrase at the time, back in 2017, that this moment in Charlottesville kind of lanced the boil of a lot of things that had been papered over before. Mm -hmm. um, what are those things? Where are we with some of those? Yeah, well, it, it was never just about the statues. The statues symbolized a lot of things that, that uh, you know, the statues were a visible manifestation of a lot of systemic things that weren't as obvious, or at least weren't as obvious to folks in power, let's put it that way. Kind of looking at how white supremacy is institutionalized, how it's built into uh, the systems, you know, that operate in our lives. I think it brought a um, magnifying glass on that and, a, and an opportunity. But there's a lot of systemic stuff that's still going on that we did not get victories on, such as trying to end qualified immunity for the police. And, uh, you know, here in, in Virginia, you know, we've got a case, uh, well, of, of young uh, Marcus David Peters, you know, in, 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 uh, in Richmond, a, you know, black man who was having a, you know, mental health episode. And, you know, and instead of you know, coming with a de-escalation strategy, especially when it comes to black folks, the police just <laughs> arrive, you know, guns blazing, you know, and that, and that you know, and he's dead. Uh, in Charlottesville, you know, we got the case of uh, Xavier Hill, you know, who was uh, killed by the, by the Virginia State Police, and we still haven't, don't have the body cam pictures of that. Um, you know, in terms of addressing systemic problems, why is there still qualified immunity for the police? here in the Commonwealth of Virginia. That, that, we did not not to win on that. Activists did not, you know, in, in you know. Explain, explain what qualified immunity means for anybody who might not be familiar with the term. Well, th well, that police aren't held accountable for crimes, actual crimes that they're committing in, 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 the, in the course of their employment, in the course of, you know, carrying out their job. So here in the Commonwealth of Virginia, there was a push by activists to end uh, qualified immunity for the police. And, and this, this bill got quashed you know, at the, at the General Assembly. Uh, you know, so, so, you know, we've notched a, a win, you know, for kind of the most obvious kind of visible symbols, you know, statues and getting them taken away. But there's, uh, there's some, um, you know, pernicious uh, systemic problems that have yet to be, you know, really fully addressed. What are you doing next? I mean, you've got all this time now. You're not leading monuments tours anymore. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, what I talk about this, you know, with the you know, people say, oh, congratulations, you know, I know you work so hard on this, you know, and, and you know, now the monuments and now you're, you're done, right? And, and I, you know, with the, with the, since the monuments are gone, and I said, no, that is the end of the beginning. You know, and again, kind of hearkening back to Zion Bryant's statement in the park on, on July the 10th, that now we need to tackle these, these systemic, uh, you know, structural uh, ways that white supremacy is embedded in our daily life and has, you know, worked perniciously to dispossess, you know, black people of, of uh, uh, economic power. I'm, I'm 
the director of the memory project at the University of Virginia's Democracy Initiative. And what I'm doing there is to look at the Blue Ribbon Commission's final report from 2016 that was submitted to to the city council. And, you know, the statute's recommendations in that report kind of got the most airtime because, of course, you know, we had a lawsuit and then we had, you know, uh, people attacking us and, you know, in a court case that went all the way to the Virginia Supreme Court. So that got all the attention. But there was actually a cluster of recommendations that were made in that Blue Ribbon Commission final report, you know. And so what I'm trying to do is kind of chip away at that. Another, you know, part of the Blue Ribbon Commission that, 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 that recommendation that was made was to, we need more teaching in our public schools about local African-American history, about, you know, infusing that. And I, I'm happy to say that at the state level, here, here's, you know, a, a victory, I would say, you know, at the state level is, you know, due again to the, uh, the hard work of the Virginia Legislative Black Caucus. Um, we now have a statewide law that uh, in order to get a high school degree from a public high school in the Commonwealth of Virginia, you must take an African-American history class. And, you know, that, that's a wonderful thing. So, you know, so here's something that the legislature is helping us, you know, is, is uh, um, bolstering what we've said at the, at the local level that we want to, you know, so that, that's a great thing. And so at the Memory Project, we're um, uh, sponsoring a young adult author, you know, to write stories about our, you know, local black heroes, you know, in our history in, with the aim toward, you know, th these being, you know, children's literature to get these into classrooms, to get these to teachers. There's some teachers here in the public schools in Charlottesville that are just doing such great work and want resources to do that with, you know, and so we're trying to get them these materials, these books, so that they can teach about this, you know, and so, you know, so that's, that's a, another goal. So these are all things that, that I'm working on that, you know, that were articulated by the community, you know, in the Blue Ribbon Commission process, you know. Um, and I'm, you know, kind of using, uh, you know, what, what, what I can contribute, you know, from, from the memory project to, you know, to, to, to uh, address these, to try to enact some of these goals. Mm -hmm. That's great. And, you know, I'm reminded, it's like, I mean, it takes stories to develop a new common sense. It takes stories to, exactly. to develop a new vision, you know, for how our, our society can be. Absolutely. Yeah, right. I mean, those statues were telling us one story, but they were lying to us, you know. Uh, they were lying to us, saying these these Confederate uh, uh, figures were heroes. When we know that half the population here uh, was enslaved, you know, did not see them as heroes. It was a it was an attempt to suppress, you know, a, a certain history. And so those statues were were telling us a certain narrative. We've taken those statues away. You know, the question keeps getting raised. Well, what should go in their place? And you know, I I, I think we need to really pause on that. You know, it's like you know, let the ground you know literally and figuratively settle. You know, and and let's think about this. Let's let's allow ourselves to take that time to to deliberate. You know, um, and um, yeah, let's tell ourselves. You know, let let's let's unearth some of these narratives that haven't got as much attention, and let's start um, celebrating people that work for freedom. Jelaine Schmidt is an activist and a professor at the University of Virginia. In a moment, we hear from a Virginia lawmaker about what the General Assembly has done and not done since the Unite the Right rally. You're listening to Bold Dominion, a state politics explainer for Changing Virginia. Find us online at bolddominion.org. Have a friend who's trying to get into state politics? Well, tell them about this show, and then subscribe. You can find us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and wherever fine podcasts are served up. While you're there, go ahead and leave us a five-star review. We love those. Bold Dominion is a member of the Virginia Audio Collective, online at virginiaaudio.org. You can check out all the podcasts from the collective, from science to history to music to community affairs. We amplify the voices of people in our community and help them tell stories that matter. You can listen and subscribe at virginiaaudio.org. Sally Hudson represents Charlottesville in the Virginia House of Delegates. She was elected after the Unite the Right rally, but much of her work in her first term was related to the fallout of that incident. She spoke with me earlier this week via Zoom. What have you seen in the General Assembly as far as how things have changed since Unite the Right? Well, um, you know, very concretely, um, literally concretely, <laughs> um, Virginia has started to, to reckon with Confederate monuments and the many ways that lost cause mythology permeates how history is taught and remembered in Virginia. And we have started to strip 
Confederate monuments and Confederate names from our public spaces and to have more serious and inclusive conversations about what we really want to celebrate as a public body. Um, and, and I think it as also thanks to the, the credit of a lot of really good organizers uh, spurred us to understand how those surface level symbolic changes are important and also just the beginning of a much more gnarly reckoning with the way that structural racism permeates housing and employment and environmental justice and, and everything else that we do. And so I think what's valuable about reckoning with symbols is that they can be conversation starters. And it's important for us, all of us who are involved in, in public service and in, in civic organizing, to make sure that the work doesn't stop there that every time that we have a conversation about a Robert E. Lee statue, that we connect it to the redlining that still segregates our homes and our schools or to the pipelines plowing through historically black communities in Southside Virginia. As long as, long as we continue to build those bridges and make sure that the symbols that catalyze conversations uh, end up getting routed to those deeper historical challenges, then I think we're making the most of that opportunity. Sally, I want to return to a phrase you used earlier about Virginia being kind of at the epicenter of this this tug of war happening in our country um, between the, the the far right and it, the sort of values that it stands for kind of now permeating a lot of, of Republican rhetoric and a different vision that's sort of rooted in more liberal democracy. How much can you draw a line from Unite the Right in 2017 in Charlottesville to like those gun rallies at the Capitol in January 2020 to the attempted coup in January 2021. I mean, like, like how much are those forces tied to one another in the state? I think they're tightly tied. In many cases, they're literally the same people in the same groups. I mean, there were people in the crowds at the Unite the Right rally in Charlottesville who stormed the Capitol uh, four years later. Um, and so they're, they're the same people, absolutely. The individuals like Richard Spencer and some of the other leaders from that day in 2017, they're pretty marginalized now. You know, they've gone bankrupt and all the rest. But the values, the ideas, the things that they stood for are pretty broadly supported within the entire Republican Party nowadays. You've got, you know, Republican gubernatorial candidate Glenn Youngkin out there pandering to the election conspiracy theory crowd. How, where, where does democracy go in Virginia when that's happening? In the near term, I think we'll see in November whether that plays out for Mr. Yunkin, it, if Ed Gillespie's election was any indication, it didn't go so well that trying to lean into that divisive and extremist mold didn't play well for him at the polls. My hope is that the electorate is still awake and energized enough not to go to sleep. But I think more generally, the question that I, I think folks on the left have to wrestle with is what role are we willing to play in fostering some kind of functional conservative movement in the country? Because as long as the only viable outlet for conservative thought is the Republican Party, which, as you said, is completely hijacked and beholden to this extremist wing, then we're going to stay stuck in this tug of war. Uh, for me, that's why I am such an active proponent of pluralistic reforms like ranked choice voting, because I think we need an escape valve somewhere for that energy. Because there, there are a lot of people in Virginia who I think are, are never just culturally going to get over the hurdle of calling themselves Republicans or Democrats. Like the, the idea of flipping parties and filling a bubble with a D next to it runs so contrary to what they've been telling themselves for decades yeah. that the outlet for their political energy is going to have to take another name and form. And if we only give them the Democrats they've always known and the Republicans that currently exist, then I think we're going to stay, stay trapped in this two-party tug of war. And so that's, that's why I think that everyone has an interest in encouraging pluralism, because we need to create an outlet for people who may not be able to 
find themselves all the way to wherever you are, but still need to break hold of the brand of extremism, which which governs their party. Does that make any sense? It does. It does. Though the the framing was funny though, because I'm hearing you say like, "Oh yeah, the left needs to help uh, help there be a functional right." I'm like, "Wait a minute, <laughs> don't we have I enough think to that's do?" Real. I, I get that that's uncomfortable for people on the left. Yeah. But like the, I mean, it doesn't matter if the left can keep winning elections fifty five forty five, if the most ten percent extreme of the country is a violent threat, if the most 20 to 30 percent extreme of the country continues to foster a global pandemic. You know, winning elections is not enough. We all have to take a stake in combating extremism. We all have a stake in a, a more stable and functional politics in every corner of the political spectrum, because we've seen that a vocal and dangerous minority can hijack the whole country. So how are we going to save democracy and keep Virginia uh, functional and, and make it work, Sally? Uh, well, I mean, concretely, we're here in August of 2021. It, progress in Virginia hinges on Democrats continuing to control the, dem- the governor's mansion and to win back the House. Everything grinds to a standstill if either of those don't happen. And you don't have to love everything about the Virginia Democratic Party to recognize that pragmatic truth. And then... If we do manage to hang on to the governor's mansion and hold the House, then Democrats have to hold our own feet to the fire and continue to make progress on good governance issues, because otherwise we we will undermine the trust that the electorate has put in us. I mean, I think voters should have us on a short leash and say, you know, you've talked a lot about. Um, being the more inclusive and responsive party. And I think we've earned the right to to go back and, and keep up that work. But the next round of work that I think we should earn the right to do uh, has to really dig into some of those those deeper thorny issues like corporate accountability, like campaign finance reform, like workers' rights that um, empower people um, not just with fundamental civil rights, but with the economic rights that allow them to to, to really flourish. You know, I think we got a lot of good work done in our first two years, but if, if we want to continue to keep earning the right to do the work, those are the next steps. Sally Hudson is a member of the Virginia House of Delegates who represents Charlottesville. Thanks to her for joining us this week, and also to Emily Gersinski and Jelaine Schmidt. My name's Nathan Moore, and I'm the host of Bold Dominion. You can find us online at bolddominion.org. And don't forget to subscribe. It's just a click away. 